Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Basic Power Sensor Measurements. In this short presentation, we're going to discuss how basic RF power measurements are made using a power sensor. As the name implies, power sensors are instruments that can be used to measure RF power. Power sensors are often grouped into categories based on how they measure power, such as thermal or diode-based sensors, or the newer receiver-based power sensors. The type of power sensor influences things such as the frequency range, usually defined as the highest frequency signal that the sensor can accurately measure, and the level range, which is the expected range of input powers. Sensor type also affects accuracy. Some types of sensors produce better results than others, and measurement speed, or how quickly the sensor can make measurements. Each power sensor type has different strengths or weaknesses. For example, we find the highest accuracy in thermal sensors, fast speed in many statistics and measurement functions in diode sensors, and very wide level range and frequency selectivity in receiver-based sensors. Power sensors can also be grouped another way, namely, what kinds of measurements can be made with them. All power sensors can measure pure power, that is, power equals x dBm or x watts. But depending on the sensor type, one can also make time-based power measurements, such as the parameters of a pulse signal's envelope, or even frequency-selective power measurements, like ACLR. However, in this presentation, we'll cover only the basic continuous power measurements that can be made with any type of power sensor. One distinction we also need to make is between power sensors and power meters. Some people use these terms interchangeably, but strictly speaking, a power sensor is a device that actually measures power. On the other hand, a power meter is a device that reads the measured values from the power sensor. Note that in order to get measurement results, we have to connect our power sensor to some kind of device that can collect and display the measurements made by the sensor. Power sensors usually don't have a display or control interface, so we have to connect them to something that can configure, control, and monitor them. There are three main ways that power sensors can be connected in order to obtain measurement results. Most modern power sensors can be attached to a PC or tablet using either USB or over a LAN connection. Software running on the PC controls both the sensor and obtains and displays the results. Another common way of connecting to power sensors is using a power meter base unit, which is a special instrument designed to connect to one or more power sensors. These meters have built-in displays to show results and can be easily accessed or controlled remotely. They also provide a hardware trigger for the attached sensors. Using a dedicated power meter base unit avoids having to deal with PCs and software, which is important in some test environments. And some instruments, such as spectrum analyzers and signal generators, allow power sensors to be connected directly to them. The attached sensors can be then controlled and the results displayed via the instrument. No matter which way we interface to the sensor, the basic measurement procedure and results are the same. After we're sure that our sensor is properly connected to our PC, power meter, or instrument, the first step in any power measurement is something called zeroing. Zeroing helps to improve accuracy and ensure the validity of our measurement result, especially when we're measuring lower power levels. As the name implies, zeroing is done with zero power applied to the sensor. This means physically disconnecting the power sensor from the device under test and then executing the zeroing function. This usually takes less than 10 seconds, but will vary based on the sensor type. Although zeroing should be done with the sensor physically disconnected from the source, in many cases this is impractical, in which case turning off the power source is an acceptable alternative. Note too that many sensors will also detect and automatically abort the measurement if you try to zero them with power still on. After zeroing the sensor, we reconnect to the source and execute the measurement. Most of the time, power sensor results will be displayed continuously, or what's called a continuous average. Essentially, this means that power is measured over defined intervals, and these intervals are called aperture time. We can also average the results from multiple intervals. Aperture time and average count are important parameters, because if we increase aperture time, and or the number of averages, this also increases the accuracy of our measurement. However, increasing the number of averages also increases the time it takes to get a measurement. This is the classic trade-off in power measurement, measurement speed versus measurement accuracy. In other words, the longer we measure, the more accurate our measurement result. Aperture length and average count are, by far, 
the most important parameters when making RF power measurements, but there are other parameters that can affect our power measurement results. These are duty cycle, smoothing, level offset, and signal frequency. Let's look briefly at each one of these. Although only certain types of power sensors can measure the parameters of pulse signals, like pulse width or rise time, all power sensors can measure the power in a pulse signal. In order to do this accurately, we need to indicate the percentage of time the pulse signal is on, something usually referred to as the duty cycle. This is because the pulse power is the average power divided by the duty cycle. For example, if we have an average power of 10 watts, and we know the duty cycle is 0.2, meaning the pulse signal is on for 20% of the time, the pulse power is simply 10 watts divided by 0.2, or 50 watts. Remember that in order to measure pulse power this way, the pulses must be rectangular, with a constant pulse rate, or duty cycle. Some types of signals can cause measurement results to fluctuate, such as pulse signals with low repetition rates, or signals with very low frequency modulation. This happens because we don't capture an entire cycle of the signal within one acquisition window or aperture. The measured power changes substantially from one aperture to the next, and this leads to fluctuating results. In these types of cases, smoothing can be enabled to get more stable and accurate power measurement results. Note, however, that smoothing increases the measured noise, so it should only be activated when strictly necessary. In some cases, we can't connect our power sensor directly to the device under test. For example, all power sensors have a maximum input power which should never be exceeded in order to avoid permanent damage to the sensor. When we need to measure power levels above this limit, we use an attenuator to bring the power level down to an acceptable level. If, however, we want our measurement results to be expressed in terms of the pre-attenuator power, we can add a level offset. A level offset is basically the difference in dB between where we want to measure power and where our power sensor is attached. For example, if we use a 40 dB attenuator to measure a 500 watt or 57 dBm source, we get 17 dBm. Adding a level offset of 40 dB would make our measurement result read 57 dBm. Level offset can also be used to compensate for losses in cables, connectors, and directional couplers between the device under test and the power sensor. Most power sensors are not frequency selective. They measure all the power they see in their bandwidth regardless of frequency. That said, it's usually a good idea to specify the frequency of the signal you're measuring whenever possible. This helps to avoid inaccuracy due to things like nonlinearities and temperature dependencies. Before we conclude this presentation, let's touch on how to avoid some of the more common errors made during power sensor measurements. Obviously, protecting the sensor from physical damage is very important. Damage can be from mechanical sources, for example, rough handling or poor connector care, as well as from electromagnetic sources, such as exceeding the sensor's rated input power. Always check that you're using the correct type of sensor for the measurement, in terms of sensor type, frequency, and power range. Usually this information is printed directly on the sensor itself. Remember also that aperture and average count are the two most important parameters in obtaining accurate results, but it's also a good idea to make sure that smoothing and signal frequency are configured properly. And of course, don't forget to zero your sensor before you start making measurements. So in summary, power sensors are the fastest, easiest, and most precise way to measure RF power. When making RF power measurements, it's important to choose a sensor or sensor technology that match the frequency range, power range, and measurement speed and accuracy needed by your application. Zeroing the sensor before use or when conditions change is always a good idea. Although there's not much configuration needed to make RF power measurements using a sensor, two parameters, aperture and average count, can have a significant impact on results. You may also need to adjust some other parameters, such as duty cycle for pulse signals, smoothing for signals that change sporadically, level offset when using attenuation, and signal frequency when the measured power is concentrated around a single frequency. And lastly, it's easy to avoid the most common errors or problems in power measurement by following a few simple guidelines. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Basic Power Sensor Measurements. Thanks for watching.